All right. It's great to be here tonight. It's great to have the opportunity to come and preach the gospel to you once again. And it's also nice to know that it's not just the Blue Jacket fans that miss me, too. So thank you so much for making me feel missed and, and, and welcome back. And, and it is a great encouragement to be able to stand before you here tonight. And it seems like I'm just, I apologize in advance because I feel like I'm very underprepared and, and maybe underdressed. Uh, I, I usually wear a suit jacket and stuff, and, and uh, what I did is I took all my clothes to the cleaners and I forgot to pick them up Saturday. So I'm wearing a lot of backup clothes today. <laughs> and, um, and on our way here, we're just crossed Ohio, and on my way, I was like, did I throw my laptop in the car? And she's like, I don't see it. So... Uh, so that's why I'm wearing the glasses. That's why my cell phone's up here. I'm not getting calls. So uh, my sermon, I, you know, it's something interesting with cell phones because you can just put just about anything on there. And believe it or not, my sermon's on here too. So, so if I look down on it, it's not seeing who's texting me. It's because I'm looking at my sermon. So I hope you'll be encouraged and edified by this message tonight. And it goes out of what Ken said there or Kenneth. I like Kenneth better, but, uh, but it goes back to what is said there in Proverbs chapter 27, uh, verse 17, where we see about how iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. And it brings just a variety of things that come along with that, of this example of what individuals are supposed to be towards one another. This iron that sharpens iron. And, you know, when I, when I, there was a young man that was preaching over in Ohio that preach this sermon. I, I did a little sermon that or a little article, if you will, on, on social media. He goes, I want you to listen to this. And he, he, uh, he's from the Grafton area. And I liked it so much. I said, stolen. So, uh, and he talked about how we need to be individuals that sharpen one another, not just individuals that uh, we, we acknowledge the casual birthday or anniversary, we, we shake their hands every Sunday and every Wednesday, but someone that is going to build us up and encourage us and make us better individuals. And I use the example about, uh, if you ever saw the movie As Good As It Gets, one of the things uh, that I always remember the movie, she says, I wish you would say one good thing about me instead of always saying something negative and the one good thing he said he goes you make me want to become a better man and i hope that after tonight when we look at these things that we will become better men and better women to each other not just individuals that are striving for that heavenly hope but we work we work well with one another that we come to this heavenly hope and when i was a kid uh one of the neat comic books that I, I read when I was a kid was The Invincible Iron Man. Not just Iron Man, The Invincible Iron Man. It just brought a very strong uh, a characteristic of what he is. He is someone that is never, uh, is indestructible, that can always take on the challenges and beat up the bad guy and the good guy always wins. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but one of the highest selling comics that he had in this publication of the Invincible Iron Man was back in the 70s when he was battling alcoholism. And one of the interesting things that I find if you follow along in that story is how this one lady, uh, from a bad experience that she had with another individual that was struggling with addiction, he's struggling with addiction, and she helps him get out of the habit of alcoholism. This is why it's one of the more recognizable article or uh, comics in our in our time and it's because of the willingness that she was going to do to help him get out of the hole that he was in and, and it just reminds us no matter how invincible we think we are or how how impervious we are to the world there is someone that we need in our life that helps us become better men and better women and, and I just want to go through some examples that I find in Scripture uh, that we look at and we should examine ourselves. Are we these individuals that will sharpen one another, that will make us better individuals because they are around us, because they want to be around us? Or are you going to be the individual that will build up someone that needs building up? You know, there's many individuals in my life I don't think I'd be here if it wasn't for them. I can remember a, uh, as a young Christian, it took one lady sitting behind me to say, I encourage you to lead a song tonight. And I led songs ever since then. We need those kind of people that will try to build us up and become better brothers and sisters in Christ. So 
What I want us to think about here is some of those passages that we see when it tells us about building up and becoming better individuals. One of the very interesting passages that I see is the one about Jonathan and David. And it goes there in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And in 1 Samuel chapter 18, you see that it tells us, it says, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And the passage I find just very interesting here is how his heart was knit to David's heart. It's very discouraging in this day and age, when we look at some passages like the Holy Kiss that we had there a couple months ago, and even a passage like this, we think there has to be some kind of compassionate love, or, or maybe a romantic love, if you will, that has to be involved in this to have this kind of relationship. And brethren, if you follow along the Hebrew word, this is not talking about anything to do with the romantic love. It is showing this is how strong that love is, and how he had this stronger love than his own soul. I want you to realize something. We look at the relationship between David and David's wife at this time, which is Saul's daughter. You can understand that that relationship was not good. And the reason being is because that's Saul's daughter and she's going to stick up for him. And we see instances in the passages, especially when it comes to the Ark of the Covenant, where she kind of ridicules him for some of the things that he does. Jonathan is not like that. Jonathan is the man that says, hey, whatever you want to do, I'm going to be with you. You look how he continues on there in verses 4 and 5. Where he tells them, he goes, John stripped himself of his robe that was on, his, on him and gave it to David. And his armor, and even his sword, and his bow, and his belt. And he went out and it was successful wherever Saul sent him. He takes everything off of him that makes him a prince and gives it to David to make him a king. I, I, there's no uh, argument about that. When we see what Jonathan looks at David, David looks at him as that is the guy that we want as a leader. And I'm willing to stick with him through thick and thin. And I will show it not only by this, by, this, uh, by this physical relationship, how I take off these things and put it on him, but we will see this relationship continue on just like that. If you go back, I think four chapters in 1 Samuel, you see that there is a relationship about Jonathan and his arm bearer. And when you look at that relationship where, where Jonathan is going to go to battle, it's just him and his arm bearer. He says, hey, let's go after the Philistines here. And if you look how he responds, it's like this. He goes, wherever you go, I will go. That's dedication. You're going into a situation where it is not good, but the arm bearer, because of who Jonathan is, says, I will do anything for you. Why would we not be surprised when we see this relationship between Jonathan and David and we say to ourselves, that's got to be a relationship that he is willing to do anything for anyone. Have you had a guy like that? Have you had a gal like that where it comes to no matter what happens in your life, you're going to stick with them or you're going to help them? Back about five or six years ago, one of the hardest things that happened to me at Lowe's is we had this layoff of management. And these were not just people that I worked with. These are people that I hung out with. These are people that I thought very highly of. And when they had this massive layoff, I remember the next day I had to come to work and deal with this. People were upset. People that have been there 20, 25 years are no longer there. And I remember one of our managers came up, and we always had a morning meeting. And, and if you think about having such a rough time with this situation that's going on, you can understand the intensity that would be when you walk into this meeting. He's, the man, he's actually the store manager now at Marietta. His name is Jared. Uh, Jared Conger. And I remember him talking about, you know, we are going through some very horrible things. And he was very honest. He says, I don't like this. He says, but I want us to kind of work through these things and let's do these things together. And right after that meeting, I followed him back to the break room. I said, you know what? I will walk through fire for you. <laughs> because he, was, he would be willing to do it for me. 
Even though we are going through these difficult times, he is not going to be an individual that says, you know what, that's just the way things are. No, nobody likes these situations. But do we have that guy? Do we have that gal? And not just someone at work, but someone within our congregation that we could sit down and we could have that kind of relationship. We'd be willing to walk through fire for them because that's my brother, that's my sister. How many times have we find in Scripture when we talk about brethren, it talks about that kind of relationship that we should be knitted to one another. I need them. We should feel like that every time when we come through those doors and we sit down. You know, there's a reason. I, I, I know it, it looks probably bad because I keep looking behind me when I, when I come here. And it's because I look for people. You know, because if there's someone that's not here, you know, that bothers me. And it's not because I, I think that they're skipping out on me or oh, Jay's, Jay's preaching tonight, so I don't want to come here. No, it's not like that. It's because something has happened where they can't be here. I don't know if I've ever told this story. But there used to be a sister in Christ that would sit in the back in the corner where Larry's sitting at. And, and her name was Nancy Bowser. She was from Fairmont. And I can remember every time, and I was appointment preacher at the time, every time I would come here, she was right there. And anything I preached on, she agreed with. I can say the sky is green tonight. Oh, yes, preach it on, brother. <laughs> you know, she, she was just that one that just shook her head and it just made me want to preach better and, and, and do better. And I can remember one of those Sundays that I came there and I preached and she's not back there. And I said, where's Nancy at? I said, well, Nancy's sick. She, she, she had a cold. She had, you know, it, it was... Nothing death, you know, uh, death of betting or anything like that. It was just she had one of those things that just made her ill and she couldn't make it out. And, and I don't know about you, but, you know, even those little colds, I miss people when they can't make it. And, but I get it. I get when people get sick. And I'm not saying, you know, I don't care if you're on an IV. You need to be here tonight. I'm not like that. But I, but I want you to think about, like, if someone's not here, though, do you really miss them? Do you really wish they were here? Do you, do you have that kind of compassion? It's like, oh, wow, I can't wait to get, off, uh, get out of here and text them and see how they're doing or call them and see how they're doing. That's where I spent a lot of my afternoons, brother. It was not just you know, going to KFC and eat. Somebody told me I eat fried chicken all the time because I'm a preacher. And I was like, no, that's not, that's not necessarily the case. I like fried chicken, but it's not necessarily the case. But, uh, but, uh, but we, you know, I spend my time calling people and asking where they're at. And not being nitpicky and, you know, kind of doing the finger wag like you should be here. Just, is everything okay? Because I miss you. We need to miss one another. We need to have those kind of relationships and, and have that kind of connection where the soul was knitted to one another. You think about Nathan and David. And, and Nathan and David was another relationship that was pretty interesting as well because Nathan was kind of the king's advisor. And Nathan was kind of the guy that he's going to tell you how it is. He, he didn't really, sh well, he somewhat sugarcoated a little bit, but we can understand when it came to David, David's sin with Bathsheba and her husband Uriah and how he put him on the front line to be killed so he could have his wife. And we see Nathan will go to David and he comes to him. He says, there are two men in a certain city, the one rich, the one poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought, and he brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. And he used to eat the morsels and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. And now there came a traveler to the rich man. He was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, this is as the Lord lives, the man who had done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the man fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are that man. 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you over the king of Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And what I want you to get out of this passage is, I'm not telling you this bad thing because I don't like you. I'm telling this thing because you need to hear it. There is going to be some hard things, brethren, that we need to hear. And we are willing and receptible to individuals who are brothers and sisters in Christ. If we are always the one that goes to the individual just to correct him and we do nothing else, don't be surprised that they are not going to be receptive to you. However, if you do show love and care and admiration for them, you want to encourage and build them up, it's not going to be that hard when it comes to the situation to say, we need to talk about a hard thing. <laughs> Nathan kind of rubbed in my face that he went to a Pirates game there a couple days ago. And it made, me think about, it made me think about one of the Pirates games I used to go to. And this is one of my favorite stories about a brother in Christ. I tell this story a lot. When Thomason Run was still a congregation, I always made plans to go up there. It's like, when would you like to come up here and preach for us? We'd love to have you. I always made it during a pirate game. <laughs> if the pirates are at home, what I did is I would go preach here that morning. I would go to a pirate game in the afternoon, and then I would preach that evening, and then I'd go home. Long day, but it was a fun day. And one of the guys that was up there with me, or was up there at the time, he would go with me. And he was a wonderful man. And we had a great time being with one another. But one of the things I, I struggled with with Matt was he rubbed snuff. And on our way to one of the games one time, we were driving along. I said, Matt, I said, I said uh, I'm going to have a sermon tonight that you're probably not going to like to hear. He says, Jay, I already know what it's about. I said, do you now? He said, yeah, it's about me rubbing snuff. I said, Matt, I said, I do believe that there are some things that I find in Scripture that tells us that we shouldn't do stuff like that. And I said, all I ask you to do tonight is just listen, hear me out. We still went to the game. We still had a good time. We came back. I preached my sermon. That night, two individuals came forward. One of them was Matt. And the one thing that I have at my house, and I've told this story, like I said, I've told this story often, one thing I have in my house is a can of Skull Long Cut that sits on my desk. And it was his. He gave it to me. And I keep it there on my desk because I hope that there's going to be a time when somebody comes to my office and they see that can and like, what do you got that there for? And I was like, oh, let me tell you about it. Because there was a moment at... Matt comes to the conclusion that he's not going to let this be the thing that keeps him out of the gates of heaven. So I keep it. And it smells awful. <laughs> but I keep it and I tell people about it. Because some people need to hear a story like that. They need to hear a story about someone who has struggled with cigarettes and, and kicked the habit. They need to hear a story about someone battling the butt. Excuse me, bow the bottle and able to overcome those things. They need to hear that. And they need to know that they're not alone in this. They need to also know that when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are imperfect people striving to become perfect for our perfect master that established a perfect church. They need to hear that. And they need to know that they're not alone in this struggle and this battle that they have. And instead of being able to beat them down for all the things that they've done wrong, they need to be encouraged to be picked up. Look there in, the song, in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, it says, A friend loves at all times, but a brother, and I know it says and, but I look at it, but a brother is born for adversity. And the reason why I put a but in there instead of an and is because the brother is going to be there whether you're happy or sad. A brother is going to be there whether you're in perfect health or you're in poor health. And that is not only the physical health, but that's the spiritual health too. He is going to be there for you. One congregation I used to work with, I said that was the congregation that I really needed to be at. And it, it took me a while to say, yeah, I'll go. I was very discouraged at the time of being a preacher. Uh, there were some things that 
that was down in my neck of the woods. I was discouraged. I was like, I don't want to go do this. And, and, and I, I just, and, and this is about 18 years ago. My son just turned 18, and, and he was getting ready to be born. And I was like, I don't want to go do this. <laughs> I want to just stay home and be a dad. <laughs> and Dean Brewer Jr. said, I think you need to go. I said, he said, I think this will help you, and it will help them. And he is absolutely right. Because what I learned up there was not to always joke around with everybody, but to have the opportunity to cry with one another too. Because we really need to mourn when there's time for mourn. This is why you see it's better to be in a house of mourning than a house of happiness sometimes. And the reason being is because there's going to be times where you need to cry and someone needs to be there to cry with you. There's times that you're going to be angry and someone will be angry with you. There's times, there's always a time it seems like, if you want to joke around, you can joke around. But when it comes to those other emotions, you need those things. You need to be angry. You need to be sad. You need to mourn. You need to weep. You need these emotions. I, I, I kind of rebuked a brother one time because he says that Christians always need to be happy. No, they don't. Because if we say that we always have to be happy, then we need to kind of curse Jesus for weeping when Lazarus died. We need these emotions. And what helps us get these emotions in control is when we have someone helping us get them in control. There's a difference between anger and letting our anger lead us to sin. There's a difference between being sad and letting that sadness lead us to sin. There's also those moments where we could be happy and we have such a kind of idol on happiness that that can even lead us to sin. And we need that guy and we need that gal to put us back to normal. That's what's great about a brother. That is willing to be there whether you're going through the hard things or you're going through the easy things. Not only the times of triumph, but the times of tragedy. If you continue on there in Proverbs chapter 27, verses 9 and 10, it says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from earnest counsel. Don't forsake your friend and your father's friend, and don't go out to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. How easy for, is it for you, brethren, that if something does happen, that you can call them? Let me put some real hard things to you. It's probably easy for me to go to Paula Prager and say, you know, Paula, I lied about something. And she'd probably have no problem with me, trying to comfort with me on that situation. However, if I go to Rollin, and I said, Rollin, I have done some sexual and moral things. Different game, isn't it? Because we don't know how to handle that. But you see that there's where some of the problems come. If we can't talk about the difficult things, we're going to have struggles within our own brethren. If we can't sit and we can have an honest discussion about things, how are we able to build one another up? You know, if my wife ever leaves me, yes, it would be sad because I really, really love her, but she's got a lot of stuff on me that I don't want out. <laughs> and she could ruin me. <laughs> but that's a great relationship in a marriage. But isn't brethren supposed to be like that too? That we can have those kind of relationships where we can confide in someone and we know that it won't be on the other side of Wellsburg by the time the church is over? Can we have that trust and faith in one another? That when it comes to a real serious and hard problem, I have the confidence I can go to someone and honestly talk about it. That's the relationship with Nathan and David. Because David can go to him and David can hear the hard truth as well as the encouragement. Because 
Nathan was not just as God that told him a hard thing. He was also the God that anointed him as king. That was a God that had his back in a good time and also had his back in a bad time. And then we go into another relationship like Elijah and Elijah. <laughs> that is a tongue twister tonight. I don't know what will be. <laughs> And hopefully I don't confuse one another here, but I want you to think about this great relationship that they had before one another. And it says, when they have crossed, and this is when Elijah is going to be carried up in the chariots. He's going to be no more. He says, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elijah said, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. You know what that means? He's saying, I want to be twice as good as you, J. Stevens terms. <laughs> I want to be twice as good as you. And it's not because he wants to be cocky or he wants to be arrogant. It's because he's going to lose him. And it's going to take twice the man that Elijah was in order to take on the challenges that's going to be faced ahead of him without Elijah. Have you ever been in that kind of situation where someone that has helped you from thick and thin and now they're gone, they're no longer there, and you ask yourself, how am I going to move on and do the things and be better at it? <laughs> Even Elijah recognizes this. He says, you asked a hard thing. And if you see me being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be. And as they, they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. Elijah went up in a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw and cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took a hold of his own clothes and tore him into two pieces. That's how strong that relationship was. Forgive me for going into baseball once again, but there was a guy that, that I grew up with as a preacher at Elk Fork named Ken Barker. We called him Pap. And when I first got to meet Ken is when his wife passed away, Tootie. And I would talk to Ken, and I noticed one of the things that Ken was, he was a Reds fan. And I said, Ken, I said, I got this great idea. I said, the Pirates are playing the Reds sometime We're up in Pittsburgh. I said, why don't you go with me? We'll go and catch a game. And, of course, he said, I'd rather go to Cincinnati, but we did that later. But, but I said, okay. I said, let's go up, and we'll, we'll catch a game. I said, I would get there a little bit early for batting practice. So he's got all his Reds garb on. I got all my Pirates garb on. We're standing up there, and we're waiting for you know, players to come by and get autographs and baseballs. And I remember this one Reds fan coming up to me. He goes, I don't understand this. <laughs> he says, how is it that you are a Pirates fan and your father is a Reds fan? I say he's not my dad. And that's what kind of relationship we had, though. That we would just look like a father and son going out there and playing and watching the game. And, you know, a couple years later, my daughter Shay had to take somebody to school and said, you know, who was, who was an influence of her? Am I doing this right, Tracy? Who was a big influence in her life? at the time, and she took him. And that's how he was in our family. When he had a birthday, we celebrated. When we, we had moments, we celebrated. When he was in the hospital, he was in the hospital, and we, we, only, we went to see him. One time I could remember, uh, he always bragged that he, he would, uh, he'd be up at 5 o'clock in the morning, go to bed at midnight. He always bragged that he was, you know, that guy that only needed five hours of sleep. Well, one time I called his bluff out, and I, I called him at 7 o'clock in the morning after I got off work, and he didn't answer. So I called his kids. I called, his, uh, I called Kenny Ray, his son, and I called Charlene, his, his stepdaughter, and I, and I even called the neighbor to find out that he was in bed. 
And that's the kind of relationship we had. Something happened, we was worried about it. Something happened to us, he was worried about us. When my mom passed away, he called. When my dad passed away, he called. And even at 80, 85 years old, he still drives an hour away to come down and see me sometimes. Do we have that kind of relationship with people that are older than us? There's a little congregation down in Belleville, West Virginia, that has no kids, that has, uh, that has a very small congregation at that. And I went there to preach one time, and after services, all three of my kids asked if I could be the full-time preacher there. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> I said, we got a congregation. But think about this. I, there was a relationship of individuals from the age probably of 50 all the way up to 85 that they just thought the world of. And those brethren did a variety of things for those kids. They went on horseback rides. They went and shot guns with John Eaton. They just did a variety of things that they had. They said, we want to be a part of this. And we always say to ourselves, we need congregations that that need young children or young people in it. We need congregations that, that have this kind of certain age group. You don't. You really just need brethren that are willing to be brethren to one another. <laughs> because if you have that, all the other things will fall into place. Think about this. Psalms 133, shortest psalm in the book of Psalms. And it tells us about how how important unity is and how really obvious unity should be. And it starts off in that very first verse, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. And then it goes into that next verse. It is like precious oil on the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, the high priest, running down on the collar of his robes. And brethren, I want you to get this kind of mindset when we talk about this oil that is on the anointed one. It is not something like you see in modern religion today when they take anointing oil and they just go across your forehead. No, this is poured on them. <laughs> and it's not like just like the little fine oil maybe you throw into uh, in, in the frying pan. No, this is like 5W30 kind of stuff that we're talking about here when it comes to oil in biblical times. <laughs> So when you saw this high priest being anointed like he is, that it's all over him, it's a mess. And it's something as obvious. And that's my point. When it comes to this anointing of this high priest that is able to carry out God's will, it is that obvious when brethren are in unity. Have you ever went into a building where you just went and sat down and you know that you're in a place of comfort because how everybody is towards one another? They're not scattered in their little groups. They're not scattered. One group's here and one group's back there. And, and a couple girls are talking here and a couple guys are talking back there. It's everybody interacting with everybody. And when you come into a building like that, how can we not say that is, a, that is the idea of Psalms 133 verse 1. And then he continues on there in verse 3 and says, It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for the Lord has commanded the blessings of life evermore. And the dew of Hermon is something very simple. It is something to where when it comes to Mount Zion, there is times that there is going to be droughts. Where there's not going to be rainfall. However, in the morning, there is this precipitation that comes out. That comes out for Hermon, out of this Mount of Zion. And you can notice it from miles away too. And it comes in without making a bang and it leaves without making a bang. But it's very obvious and it's, very, it's, it's something that is so subtle that it's something that is noticeable. And you know when it's gonna happen. Have you ever had individuals come to you and you're overwhelmed by their affection. Have you ever went to someone and had somebody overwhelmed, overwhelmed them with your affection? That's what this relationship with Elijah and Elijah is like. It is something that is obvious. There's been many congregations that I've went to that it seems like it could be 
the intensity could be cut with a knife, the awkward silence and how everybody walks in and everybody walks out without saying one word. Is that really something that, the, the, that we could say there in Psalms 133? How pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity when we come into a situation like that? I want you to be mindful of one more passage and the lesson will be yours. There's one statement that Jesus reminds us that we can become his friend. Maybe you can't build those relationships here in this world. But if we have this one relationship in Christ, I truly believe all the other things will fall into place. And it comes through just very simple statements that Jesus will say to his disciples. He says, here is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Many people today, on this particular day, will talk about anything from the foot washing to the crucifixion to the resurrection. And we'll see all kinds of examples of people showing what Christ was willing to do for other individuals. There's many people that will probably do foot washings in the past couple weeks. There are some people that will imitate the crucifixion of Christ, even to the point that they will pierce their own hands and pierce their own feet to show this devotion to Christ. However, if we don't continue on the things that Jesus tells us about these are the things that we need to do, it doesn't matter how many feet you wash. It won't matter how many times you pierce your hands or your feet or throw a crown on your head or how many times you replicate walking up and down uh, Route 50 where I live at where people are carrying crosses for miles upon miles. If we do these things, if we don't practice this one commandment that Jesus specifically says to you that is the greatest commandment, just like the love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your strength and with all your might if we can't practice these things it doesn't matter it does not matter if we can't replicate the love that he has shown for not just those disciples but shown for everyone including this sacrifice he has made because he says you're worth it if we're not willing to do those things, all the other things we do are pointless. Maybe someone here tonight has struggled with taking the next steps in their faith. Maybe it comes to baptism. We have all these things prepared in order for us to baptize one to Christ. For those who need that part when it comes to their salvation. There is men that's able to do it. There is, uh, there's things that's provided in order to do it. All it needs is you. And these brethren here at this congregation made sure that if that time comes and it's right now, we don't have any reason to say we can't do it tonight. If we're going to replicate these things, if we're die hard to replicate feet washings and and crucifixions and, walk, and bearing a cross. And we understand that one of those replications that's necessary is baptism. Christ practiced it. He also taught it. But he also taught about repentance as well. And how important it was for you and I to repent of sins if we were doing things wrong in the eyes of God. And he brings that message very strong to you and I. If we're not willing to repent, we will all likewise perish. But one of the things we find interesting, too, is how often Jesus prayed. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed for his cup to pass from him. But he also prayed for unity as the disciples. He also prayed for, uh, uh, for unity as those disciples that will come along later. He talked about the importance of prayer, and he practiced it. We have an opportunity to do that here tonight also, if anyone needs that. Whatever you need here tonight, let's do something about it right here, right now. If we need to respond, won't you come while we stand, while we sing.